May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, our Lord and Redeemer. Amen. The statue of St. Francis by Benny Bufano that stands just inside the doors of Grace Cathedral is one of my favorite pieces of art in the city. Several years ago, I was at Grace for Evensong on St. Francis Day, and Bishop Mark invited us to stand and imitate the posture of the statue and hold our arms out like this. So if you are at home watching this, take a moment and put your arms out in this position. This position is taking on the shape of the cross, which Francis called the Tau, or T-shape. The Tau became the symbol of Francis's order of Franciscans. Staying open like this in the shape of the cross, rather than shut down like this, is one of the challenges, I think, of living in 2020 these days. Like Francis himself, the Benny Bufano statue is playful and profound at the same time. His, voice, his face is graced with a smile and his outstretched arms remind us of the cross. In that combination of joy, wonder, and suffering, Francis teaches us about the way of Christ and the way of love. I wonder what Francis can teach us in these chaotic days. Francis lived between 1182 and 1228. It was a time of upheaval in medieval Europe when the church was struggling with corruption and a lack of purpose. There was great poverty and great wealth. There was war. As a man of the upper middle class, Francis joined the army and fought against Perugia, the city-state next door. He was a prisoner of war for over a year, and the solitude and deprivation caused him to reflect on the purpose of his life. And there was disease. People in Assisi and other Italian towns were regularly asked by the clergy to prove that they were free of skin diseases. If they didn't pass inspection, they could be thrown out of the city walls and forced to live as outcasts until they could prove they were cured. As Francis became radicalized by the gospel, he saw how the sick were rejected by the community, and as his conversion continued, he embraced a life of poverty and began to serve those homeless lepers outside the city walls. Francis moved into the church of San Damiano, which was in disrepair. He spent hours in prayer in the church asking God, who are you? There was a crucifix hanging from the ceiling, much like the one we have here in the rafters. And Christ spoke to Francis from the crucifix and said, Francis, Rebuild my church. Francis thought Christ wanted him to rebuild that little chapel and proceeded to rebuild it stone by stone. But he ended up rebuilding the larger Western church, soul by soul. I think this has relevance to our gospel passage today, where Jesus says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. As educated, maybe skeptical people, we don't really want to hear, I think, that God may not reach out to us through our intellect. 
As Richard Rohr says in his book, Hope Against Darkness, the transformational vision of St. Francis in an age of anxiety, he says, education is not the same as transformation. Education is not the same as transformation. Francis humbled himself and opened himself to the point where he could hear Christ speaking to him. He listened and he acted. He was trusting like a child. Francis didn't intend to reform the church, found an order, or become a leader. But people saw Christ in his example of sincerity and simplicity, and they followed him. In our psalm today, we hear a song of praise to God and creation, including sea monsters, creeping things, and winged birds. We can imagine Francis singing this psalm out in the beautiful Tuscan countryside. Legend says Francis preached to the birds, and there's also the famous story of the wolf who was terrorizing the village of Gubbio. The village leaders called in Francis to help them. Francis quietly asked the wolf why he was attacking animals and villagers. The wolf told Francis that he was hungry. Francis and the wolf came to an agreement that if the village people fed him, he would behave. So the village fed the wolf, and the wolf became the village's friend. What I hear in this famous story is Francis' ability to listen deeply. If you've ever had a pet, you have an inkling of how that works. Francis had the ability to be on the same wavelength as the wolf and other creatures because he identified as a human being in creation rather than a human being over creation. He had an intuitive understanding of the interdependence of nature. While the church saw the world as fallen and sinful and used sin as a way of control, Francis listened to God and affirmed the goodness of God's creation, the goodness of humanity as part of that creation. Recognizing the goodness of creation and humanity is the bedrock of Franciscan theology. When I was a chaplain at Trinity School in Menlo Park, we would begin chapel at the nursery school by saying, when God and I are so close that you can't see between us, that is when we pray. And then we would offer our prayers. Francis and Christ were so close that Christ's wounds became eventually visible on Francis' body. On September 14th, Holy Cross Day, Francis was walking in retreat on Mount Laverna when a six-winged angel came towards him and gave him the marks of Christ's wounds, the stigmata, on his hands, his feet, and his side. In our reading from Galatians today, we hear the Apostle Paul write, May I never boast of anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. From now on, let no one make trouble for me, for I carry the marks of Jesus branded on my body. And scholars believe that perhaps Paul also might have received the stigmata. Though we will never receive the stigmata and may even recoil from the idea, I think that we have all received our own wounds, our own marks of suffering in our lives that can help us identify with Francis and with the suffering of Christ. And I think that Franciscan theology of the cross 
is helpful for us in the chaos that we are experiencing right now. Paul and Francis understood the cross as a symbol of transformation, as an intersection of the divine and the human. Through the cross, Jesus shows us a way of humility and power at the same time. The cross is a symbol of paradox because life itself is paradoxical. Richard Rohr himself, a Franciscan, writes, the cross is about how to fight and not become a casualty yourself. The cross is about being the victory instead of just winning the victory over someone else. The cross is about how to stand against hate without becoming hate yourself. The cross calls all of us to a mystery of transformation. Today we also celebrate Claire, St. Claire, a young, wealthy Italian woman who heard Francis preach in the year 1212 and like Francis, renounced her family position and founded an order called the Poor Ladies of St. Damien. Her life was transformed by the gospel and the message of humility preached by Francis and through the example of his life. In these strange times of 2020, when truth is hard to find, and we mourn the degradation of our Mother Earth, and we find it hard to breathe with the smoke in the air and the pollution, the example of St. Francis and St. Clair, I believe, can refresh us. As Jesus says at the end of our gospel passage today, come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's continue to stand with our arms outstretched, open and trusting, believing in the love of Christ as Christ loved us on the cross and brought us to victory in the resurrection. Let us follow him, St. Francis and St. Clair, on the way of love. Amen. <laughs>